Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjunginlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So my book comes out on May 25th, and I'm really excited to announce that I'm going to be having a virtual book launch at the New York Open Center on May 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll be in conversation with Mirabai Starr, and we'll be talking about motherhood, obviously, and we'll be talking about Mirabai's work. And we're going to take a close look at a fairy tale and do some journaling around that. So I hope that you will consider joining us. The website is opencenter.org forward slash motherhood. And we'll put that link in the show notes. I hope to see you there. Today, we're going to talk about an idea that is intrinsically related to Jung's contributions, introversion, as an attitude that people seemingly are born with. What are the implications of it? How do we define it? And do people even realize that the idea of introversion and extroversion as a psychological quality really came from Jung and his work? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those terms that we immediately, everyone knows it. It's really permeated the culture. It has been scientific, empirically validated. And it was uh, Jung who introduced this idea. It was indeed. He was influenced a little bit by Uh, some of the earlier psychologists who were mulling over these differences. An early psychologist uh, called Binet in the early 1900s, while he was trying to struggle with describing the way his two infant daughters were so remarkably different from each other, he coined the term externospection and introspection. Because he was noticing this difference between relating to outer the outer world versus relating to the inner world. Jung would have come across that, but this was a very superficial treatment of that idea that Jung broke out and really wove into his entire theory of individuation. Mm-hmm. And I think Jung got interested in it because he, after his break with Freud, was really mulling over, you know, how are we different? And how are Freud and I different from Adler? And so he worked on what we now know as volume six of the collected works, which is all about typology. And that's where we get these terms. Right, trying to understand how it is that we take in and process information differently Mm -hmm. so that we have such different reactions. Yep. And Jung's work later gave birth to the MBTI or the Myers-Briggs Typology Index, which was formulated by two women. And 
has become very much part of corporate culture, for example, widely used. People are familiar with it. And we go around saying, well, I'm an extroverted thinking type or I'm an intuitive uh, feeling type. Well, it's very interesting because some, it's not uncommon for people on Twitter to put their a Myers-Briggs type in their little bio, which I always kind of get a kick out of. <laughs> so yeah, it's really become currency in the culture. I remember the first time that I did the Myers-Briggs, I was working for a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., and, and we had a you know, one of those kind of staff workshops, team building kind of things. And we all did the Myers-Briggs. And it, I remember it was really interesting because one of the things that Myers-Briggs does and typology in general does, I think, is say there are differences. We have different strengths, different weaknesses. One's not better than the other. So it kind of allows you to feel more compassion for yourself and for other people when you understand that some of the friction just comes from these different attitudes. And it's an incredible relief to have language to describe right. oneself. Being able to communicate, I'm just an yeah. introvert. And it really has nothing to do with liking you or disliking you. I just move inwardly, and you tend to move outwardly. Mm-hmm. I agree that the whole, all of the typology stuff is a big help in, in reframing or seeing differently why I and another person or any other two people uh, may kind of rub each other the wrong way. In couples work, something as simple as having both partners take the Myers-Briggs typology inventory, which is probably the most common way now that people come to these ideas, and then being able to discuss, as you said, the chafing points as an issue of typology, not animus or negativity between the partners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just diff. It's just different. Introverts and extroverts see the world and experience the world differently without any intention to be irritating or harmful to another person. Well, should we try to define introversion before we go (laughs) much further? (laughs) Sure. Here's um, a description that Jung gives in volume six, paragraph 535 of the collected works. And he writes, the introvert is distinguished by his self-assertion vis-a-vis the object. He struggles against any dependence on the object. He repels all its influences and even fears it. So much the more is he dependent on the idea which shields him from the external reality and gives him the feeling of inner freedom, though he pays for this with a very noticeable power psychology. So the first thing I just want to unpack in that quote is the idea of the object, being dependent or not dependent on the object. And um, let's talk for a minute about what, what an object is. And one way of thinking about it is an object is an entity which attracts attention and or satisfies a need. So that's a very, from object relations, that's a very basic description of it. Right. This is this particular kind of psychoanalytic use of the term object. Yeah, it's it's always odd, and it was to me, to hear about uh, internal objects or object relations as a way of speaking about interpersonal relations or mother-infant uh, dynamics. So it, it is kind of a uh, first glance, a peculiar uh, kind of verbalization. So a way of imagining this is that when we have an introverted friend, let's say, and they are interacting with us, the introverted friend sees us and of course knows we're there, but has a very intricate idea and image of who we are to them, which is nurtured in their imagination and in their thinking. And they naturally spend more time reflecting on their idea of you, which is more attractive to them, than actually tending you as an external person. Rilke says, I am in love with you, 
and it's none of your business. <laughs> hmm, that's great. That's great. <laughs> so the external relationship pales in comparison to the internal idea of the beloved, which often is much more rich and informed by archetypal influences. I am uh, th thinking that the implications of this, uh, at least thus far in our discussion and exploration, sort of imply that introverts are less loving somehow uh, than extroverts, and that is certainly not the case. It's s somewhat of a different orientation toward the other. And I could imagine that for an introvert, uh, having that internal image and idea of the other uh, could really add a lot that would enrich a relationship because it gets cycled through an internal set of filters so that both people, in a way, can be in the relationship, both the introvert's inner self and the external uh, person or object. For me, I hear that and I think, okay, and then I want to see if I can translate it into my own experience. Mm -hmm. So I know that one of the things that I remember hearing introversion described as via the Myers-Briggs was it, it's sort of where you get your energy. Do mm -hmm. you get your energy from being with other people? That's extroversion. Or from being alone, introversion. I don't know that that exactly works for me either in trying to pinpoint what we mean by introversion. I, I think picking back up on what you were talking about, Joseph, there there is something about the degree of importance of the inner world versus the external world, how much energy the inner world has versus uh, the external world. And I, I guess I come at this as someone who early on tested as an extrovert, but more recently I test as an introvert. So I feel like perhaps I've maybe mm -hmm. had both experiences. You know, there's something about tempo that extroverts can be very quick. They know what they think. They know how they feel. While introverts often have to go inside to learn uh, what, they, what they think or feel about a given situation. Well, I, what I want to amplify just a little bit is that initial idea of introverts prefer to be alone, extroverts prefer to be in groups. I think often extroverts want to be in relationship with several people, even simultaneously, like a cocktail party. And extroverts gain a lot of energy. It's very exciting because they're tending the external person in the room. They're monitoring the external person in the room and adjusting to what's happening in that space. When we say that the introvert is alone, they're alone with their inner content, yeah. which is just yeah. as real as yeah. an external companion, which That's I think way of putting it. extroverts find odd <laughs> mm -hmm. because they don't, they, they would find that perhaps, uh, even punishing to just be alone. Yeah. But to an introvert, their inner objects are incredibly vital and incredibly um, present to them. And in, in fact, being around other people can be a distraction. Exactly. Right. So it really has an awful lot to do with where we get energy. Uh, what fuels us? Where does our libido go? of whether we get fed and energized by interaction with people in the external world or whether we get fed and energized by being with ourselves, reading, reflecting, walking, knitting. And of course, all of us get energy from both of those sources. No, nobody can live entirely in the external or internal world. I think it's a question of percentages or balance how much of me wants to be out there versus in here. This also has something to do with the four functions. So as Jung's typological system continued to mature in, as he was developing it, introversion and extroversion were called primary attitudes. 
And then there were four functions, intuition, sensation, feeling, and thinking. And those functions can be described as turning inward or turning outward. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, once the primary function is determined like extroverted feeling, then the next function generally compensates for that by being primarily an introverted function. So I'm in ENFJ, so extroverted feeling is a primary function, and I also rely on introverted intuition. Mm -hmm. So everyone balances their, their primary and secondary qualities by flipping introversion and extroversion, but we almost always tend to be most skillful and most energized by our primary function. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of um, a quote that I ascribed to Winnie the Pooh of this gets complicated -er and complicated. -er. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, let, well, let's go back into um, Jung's core idea and see if we can unpack this because I find this interesting and this is not something that's clearly discussed in the Myers-Briggs stuff, which I think is somewhat derivative of Jung's much larger sure. work. Ab yeah. Absolutely. So the statement we've already brought forward is introversion is an inward turning of libido yeah. or life yeah. force. Yes. Yeah. So we can imagine a kind of river of energy. It can flow out and be invested in outer things whether they're objects that are attached to lots of memories for us or people that we need to visit a lot, or it goes inside. Now, what Jung brought forward, which is not present, as I said, in the Myers-Briggs, is that the introverted function inherently is turning away from the outer object towards the archetypal idea that the object might be most closely matched to. Mm -hmm. That's a very profound statement. Yeah. And, and a radical shift from extroversion. Yeah. So there's, there's really this kind of gravitational pull that the archetypal world is exerting on the personality and pulling the energy in. Exactly. And because archetypes are so kind of godlike almost, that when we're in touch with an archetype, it is compelling. And so when we think of deep introverts, the things that they are considering internally seem luminous yeah. and extraordinarily impactful. Can I, can I riff on that for one second, Joseph? Yeah. So Jung was an introvert. He, he was probably profoundly introverted. And you, you can get a sense of exactly what you were just talking about when you look at Jung's biography, because he was above all interested in ideas. I mean, I think he was interested in ideas before he was interested in people. And he obviously felt deeply drawn to spend time in the inner world. I mean, that's kind of what Bollingen was about, you know, his tower that he would go off and, and spend weekends in. And we see this in the story about his relationship with Tony Wolf and eventually how that lost energy for him is he was compelled to engage in a, an affair with Tony and it was their relationship became a kind of crucible in which he developed many of his important ideas. And then he got gripped by the idea of alchemy and Tony couldn't go with him on that. She was not interested in alchemy. She couldn't follow him there. And, you know, slowly the relationship cooled. So it was, it was more about the ideas than the people. And I think that that can be a function of introversion. Yeah. So it's interesting uh, how introversion relates to uh, kind of a thinking versus a feeling function and also toward a kind possibly of preoccupation, mm -hmm. even even withdrawal, mm -hmm. you know, and various other kinds of characteristics that, that have both um, an upside and a downside. Absolutely. I think people who are profoundly introverted may not be inclined to call you up very mm -hmm. frequently. And yet, internally, they experience themselves as being very close to the idea of you 
which is a reality for them. Hmm. What, let me unpack a little bit of Jung's idea of relating internally to the archetype or the archetypal idea. So the archetypal idea resides in the inner world. And then depending on which function that's pressing on, it could be understood as a profound thought, a profound value, a profound metaphorical image, or a profound model of reality. And that's tempered by whether the introverted function is thinking, feeling, intuition, or sensation. So yes, it can show up as uh, a thought, but when it shows up as a value, we know we're coming from this feeling function. The metaphorical image comes from introverted intuition, and an internal model of reality is int you know, introverted sensation. So the functions can still be all incredibly engaged, but are still circling around these archetypal components of those several functions. And I think interpersonally, as you were saying, Deb, when the introverted function is used to orient to something external, in the end, the orientation is the comparison to the archetype because the outer object is not particularly stimulating in itself. So that can seem like they are withdrawing. So let me give a concrete example of this, <laughs> which I'm up against all the time in my practice. Because of the podcast, all three of us create a certain idea in people's minds of who we are. And it's not uncommon for people to come to me uh -huh. secretly thinking I'm a wizard or something like that, which might be true. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> So that archetypal feeling, value, thought, image, schema is carrying them into reaching out to me. And then if I have room, scheduling a session, and I can feel that in the first weeks or months, you know, the way that they're listening to my interpretations is, is almost like I'm, you know, creating magical incantations. And then sooner or later, some part of my humanity will become very obvious. And I can see their <laughs> disappointment, the profound <laughs> disappointment that, oh my God, he's just a guy. <laughs> and and I can and then I, at that point I'm I had this feeling like I'm not sure they're gonna stay in the analysis because they've discovered I, I'm actually not Gandalf. Mm. <laughs> And, and that happens much more frequently with introverts. Extroverts are much more engaged with my outer personality and, and kind of are willing to continue to uh -huh. be related no matter what they kind of discover. So uh, what I think you're saying is that for introverts and the desire to relate to an archetypal image affects the projection that they may make on you or on someone else, that they're relating to something in an inner world through you, whereas an extrovert would just be like, you know, hey there, let's get it on. Absolutely. And the introvert often, through the podcast, has already established the kind of archetypal idea that they're searching for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And comparing that to their actual experience of me, and I'm actually a New York gutter snipe, so that's always disappointing <laughs> to them to discover Joey. that. <laughs> Joey. Joey Lee. <laughs> this also happens with something even like a restaurant, that for someone's deeply introverted, the archetype of the really good meal, mm. the archetype of the feast, and, and all of what that means to them, especially if they have like introverted sensation, they're coming to the feast and it winds up not living up <laughs> to the feasts of the gods, uh -huh. which, which they're imagining somewhere in the back of their minds. I'm wanting to pivot a little bit and 
pull back to this idea about introversion just as a sort of basic personality temperament. I mean, we, we mentioned before that this was a term coined and popularized by Jung, but it has been uh, empirically validated. It's uh, introversion, extroversion are part of the big five personality traits that have been very well studied. And the notion of intro- introversion versus extroversion has appeared to be a very stable part of people's personality. And in fact, I believe it's one of the most kind of hardwired aspects of personality, if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken. And I remember really seeing this with my daughter when she was an infant. So I think we can map introversion onto another term that's sometimes used for temperament in babies, which is slow to warm up or some, you know, they used to call it shy. This can be really worrying to parents when you have a quote unquote shy kid and you can worry, did I do something wrong? Or especially in in American culture, which is so extroverted, shy kids are Mm -hmm. often a cause of concern for parents. But it is just so normal, and some of us just come out that way. So when my daughter was an infant, I used to take her to like a baby playgroup, which is sort of a hysterical idea, but really it's just a chance for moms to like have conversation with another human being. But I don't know, there were, you know, six or eight moms and we'd get together once a week and we would get there, it would usually be about 90 minutes long. My daughter and I would get there and I think she was one of the older infants in the group. All of the other babies would be crawling around on the floor or sitting on the floor and, you know, sucking on things or whatever. And (laughs) my little girl would not leave my lap she would watch intently at what everything everyone else was doing, but she did not want to leave my lap until about the last 15 minutes. And then she would get down and she'd want to engage. And, you know, I, I just remember being really struck by this. And then it was so different from, you know, my number two baby who was immediately very sociable, very directed energy was very directed out in the world. And so you do get the sense that you just come into the world and, you know, different. And this is, this is just a very kind of stable personality trait in some sense. Now, it's not that we can't learn to, it's not that being a shy kid means you're going to struggle socially, right? That they're not, this is not the same thing, but, it, but it is this fundamental attitude that will influence how we kind of process things. So we have an innate ability to track these qualities in other people, even in our children. One of the things that can be very painful for introverts is being born in the United States. There is a strong bias towards extroversion and a fantasy that extroverts are the ones that are going to do the best in the culture. Mm -hmm. So parents with a naturally introverted child thinking they're helping them often are kind of pushing them on stage to, you know, do the ballet performance or putting them in front on and on and on thinking that they're going to bring them out of their shell, (laughs) which can lead to something called a false extroversion. I'm really uh, back with the designation of our culture as fundamentally extroverted. And it very definitely is, in my view, Americans value that highly, which uh, has given rise in my mind to reference to a book entitled Quiet, The Powers of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. We'll put it in the show notes. It's by Susan Cain. Uh, And she tells a story that I won't get exactly right. So this is the gist of it at Harvard Business School, an Asian American man uh, was being encouraged and pressured as our women uh, to talk, to engage, to be forthright, to put himself out there, to interact with teams. And then he had an internship in Japan, I believe, and just really sort of had this big exhale of, of comfort that as he had gone to a different culture where people listened more the pace uh, 
the tempo, as you said earlier, Lisa, was slower. And it fit and suited him much better. And uh, I think the realities of our families, the school systems, and overall culture are hugely relevant here, as they were for your infant daughter, Lisa. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she, it's perfectly fine for her to be the way she is, but it you can look like my kid's out of step. Yeah, I mean, I think there can be a lot of parental anxiety around introverted children, which is unfortunate because that often gets kind of communicated unconsciously to the kid. But it, but it is very cultural how these things are viewed. We do value extroversion a lot in in our culture, and it does get rewarded uh, in ways that introversion sometimes isn't. But that doesn't mean, as per Susan Cain's book, that the introverts among us don't come with great and important gifts. And many of my closest friends are introverts. <laughs> 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 I know that may sound amazing, but uh, but but introverts are able to, when they choose, into very deep and subtle and profound conversations. Mm-hmm. They often do better in a one-to-one situation, and often with my introverted clients, as long as I just keep my trap shut, they have no <laughs> trouble, you know, bringing forward material for an entire hour. The thing that's really obvious is that when I interrupt them and draw them to the fact that I'm physically present in the room, it seems infinitely annoying to them (laughs) (laughs) because they're talking to their idea of me, which is Uh much more enhanced than my actual (laughs) presence. (laughs) You know, I, I think there is a way here. My thoughts are turning to how we can really learn from each other's orientation, that the strength of an introvert can be filtering things through himself or herself uh, simultaneously with engaging in a dialogue with the other person. And that can add a real richness to perception, conversation, feelings, ideas, bringing forth new material. And, uh, the, the loss can be being preoccupied with oneself while in the presence of another person. Extroverts will go toward the other person first and may lose that connection internally with self of, wait a minute, can I also self-reflect while I interact with this person? What am I doing and saying? Where is that kind of coming from uh, in me? And I think for everybody, I mean, ideally, it would be the capacity to develop both a connection internally with self and with the other. I think that absolutely happens. And and as I'd mentioned, the secondary function for an introvert is always some form of extroversion. So an introverted thinking type can have extroverted sensation or extroverted feeling as a secondary skill, which they can access and should develop. I mean, even in the first half Mm -hmm. of life, the auxiliary function is very important to to have some kind of a compensation for it. So um, I'm interested to uh, fantasize a little bit about how introversion shows up in sensation, thinking, intuition, and feeling. And maybe we can find some examples of this in family or friends or clinical environments. So we talked a little bit about introverted sensation, that when the introverted sensate comes to a meal, that the archetype of the good meal or the feast is something that they're carrying innately and not something they may even be conscious of, but that the inner world is powerfully alive as they're preparing to engage in it. This internal expectation, this internal idea, in fact, is essential because rallying to show up at the dinner party is often very difficult (laughs) because as they're imagining interacting with the dinner plates and the noise and maybe 10 people in a room, the intuitive sensate knows that those external sensations will overstimulate 
the outer experience, which will seem to ruin the inner experience. So intuitive, rather introverted sensates have to titrate how much external stimulus that they're involved with in order to keep the internal experience clean and appealing to them. So I'm wondering if any of us have had that Mm -hmm. experience maybe with friends or family, because we are all extroverted feeling types, where someone you know, someone comes to mm-hmm. participate. One of the kids who's very introverted comes to participate and that they can just be overwhelmed by the physical sensations in the environment. And I often see this with children, particularly young children who are introverted and parents can see it, that the child is kept at the party too long. Mm-hmm. The, the noise, the cake, the balloon popping, that there, there's an absolute um, <laughs> threshold and that kid is done and they'll just start crying because the external stimulation is, is so violating to the introverted sensation. This can also be a struggle for people around being touched. If someone's primary function is introverted sensation, actually being touched frequently, even by loved ones, can become so overstimulating that they withdraw. And they withdraw to the, to the internal representation of the touch. Have you guys run into friends uh, or clients who really have a hard time being touched? I definitely have talked to people who have a hard time being touched. I think that's pretty common. I'm also thinking, I was thinking I was back a bit at what you were talking about before about kind of the stimulation and the kid at the party and a couple of things were coming up for me. First of all, I'm not so sure I'm extroverted. I, I'm I'm not so sure about that. And I know for me <gasps> <gasps> What? She's infiltrated our, our <laughs> troop. <laughs> But I know for me, I like I can't stand grocery shopping. It it feels and I shouldn't say I can't stand it, but it's it's <laughs> difficult for me because I get so overwhelmed so quickly. And it and it feels it feels really tiring. It feels really taxing. I don't do well at it. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, meaning that I I I tend to sort of, you know, forget things or or buy the wrong thing because it, there's just so much stimulus coming in in a in a, especially in a large grocery store or or a department store same thing like in some way i love it but i just feel so taxed and overwhelmed and impinged upon and always have to a certain extent so i think mm-hmm. maybe that's introversion as well and then i was thinking about the thing about the kid at the party which i absolutely know what you're talking about and i don't know where this fits into everything i think we have to be careful I wanted to bring this up. I think we have to be careful not to let introversion become an excuse. I think it has, I mean, if we say, oh, my kid's introverted, so I need to pull her out of the party. Well, maybe. I mean, I think it's good to be attuned to a kid and what she might need. You know, and it was the right thing for me to do to let my daughter sit on my lap until she was ready to get down. Hmm. However, if we're constantly saying, oh, well, Katie's very introverted, so she, you know, will have to leave gym class early today. I think we ter- we can coddle. It turns into coddling, which is a problem with our chil- children. It's a problem their self, too. Introversion can become an excuse for being an asshole, and that's not okay. Yeah. And I, I, I'm interested in the downsides of that, too. Can it turn us into avoiding things? I mean taken to extremes, this is associated with pathology. Exactly. Avoidance and schizoid tendencies, that kind of just encapsulation or isolation, or just detached, the highly sensitive person or the person who's repressed. You know that there's a way in which this can shade into things that don't serve anyone well, that can be related to being introverted. And we could say, you know, different things about people that are extroverted. But I think what you're pointing to, Lisa, and I'm trying to build on is that we need to become whole. We can't just say, well, um, you know, my child is introverted and therefore doesn't have to stick around for gym class. 
of where should we be stretching ourselves to develop other functions? And when do we say, hey, look, I'm, I'm out of here. And, and, you know, here's the thing, Deb, is that I don't even know that I'd say we have to become whole. I would say we have to be able to adapt. Ah. And extroversion tends to be helpful when adapting to the outer world. Introversion tends to be critical when adapting to the inner world. And we need to be able to do both. Yeah, I, I think that's right on. And adaptation is, is crucial. And we hopefully do both. So I'm noticing that our process feels a little different to me today. Are you guys getting that as well? I have been uh, thinking about very much the same thing and relating it to my introverted intuitive function. And I keep wanting to say, now, wait a minute, let me, let me think about that. Let me, let me uh, reflect on that for a minute that I'm aware that my thoughts are not coming as fluidly mm -hmm. today yeah. yep. as they often do just because our very topic is calling mm -hmm. up a function that is not naturally uh, where I, where I speak from. Yeah. It's really been invoked. I mean, it, cause I do think that obviously we're in a kind of extroverted mode on the podcast where mm -hmm. we're really pinging off each other and I'm finding myself doing the same thing, Deb. I'm like needing to go in and think about it. And then it's not, it's not coming as fluid. So we've, we have constellated something here today, I think. Yeah. I'm thinking right now. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I, 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 I do want to say, and then Joseph, maybe we can go, because maybe I'm even anticipating what you're going to say is, um, for me, there's so many times when I don't know how, what I think about something, or I don't know what I feel about something. For me, when I, when I watch a movie with a friend, and the friends say, well, what, you know, what'd you think? Did you like it? And I, I literally, I don't know, but I'll know the next day. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's some way that I'm introverted, wouldn't you say, Joseph? Whether you're an ENFJ or an INFJ, introverted thinking is either a tertiary or your inferior function. And it's my inferior function, Deb's as well. <laughs> so it means we have to dig deeper yeah. to get to really think. And even then, our thinking function is going to be colored by more unconscious material than... Mm somebody who's an introverted thinking type professionally, who just has that quality really, really highly developed. So an easier question might be, how do you feel about it? Mm -hmm. How do you feel yeah. about that movie? Mm -hmm. And we can access that more quickly, even if it's just, mm -hmm. I liked it or I didn't. Yeah. As yep. feeling types, we know whether or not we like something really quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something that I find in the consulting room a lot is the difference between uh, feeling types and thinking types and what is more introverted in a person versus, versus extroverted. And that there are people that really struggle with, did I like it or didn't I like it? How do I feel about it? And it's much easier for them to tell, to say what they think. And then for other people, it's the other way around. I, I know in our training, we had all these oral exams and review committees and all the rest of it. I think I just was forever tripping over my own feet because it called on me to extrovert intuition and extrovert thinking. And both of those are introverted. And it was sort of like, tell me right now, about this or that or the other, and it'd be like, wait a minute, Ugh. it's not all ready to go. I can't just pop it out there in the moment. And the majority of Jungian analysts are introverts, mm -hmm. that there's something mm -hmm. about Jung's literature and the way being an analyst is described that introverts flock to this field. So there you are mm -hmm. being examined by a group full of introverts who really do, in fact, have a hard time <laughs> understanding extroverts and often feel highly suspicious yes. of extroverts. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, you sound like you're being a little too facile. Uh, yes. uh, uh, the words are just flowing out. Why don't you slow it down? You know what? Think about it a little bit. <laughs> Joseph. Like an introvert. Joseph. 
<laughs> Are you speaking from personal experience? This, this is exactly the experience I had. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does sound confessional. <laughs> but it's true. There is a suspicion in the Jungian world toward extroversion. And by the way, I think it's probably true that most therapists are introverts. It's a very introverted kind of activity. You sit in a room with the door closed and listen intently to another person. I think that social workers tend to be more extroverted, though, than mm -hmm. counselors. And I would say for me... Uh, what I have loved so about this work is its extroverted aspect of the re the opportunity to relate deeply and um, in such a multifaceted way. It has been really rewarding for my basic extroversion. Mm -hmm. So let's jump in to the idea of introverted thinking. So introverted thinking as a primary leading function is most difficult in interpersonal relationships. And a way to think about it is that when you're talking to an introverted thinking type, the person often has a distinct feeling that they are being perceived negatively and that they're being evaluated or judged in some way, which the introverted thinking type may not in fact be doing. But the thinking function is constantly comparing the person in front of them to the ideas that are circulating around that in person, which feels very distancing and feels strange and very clinical. And in a sense, when introverted thinking is primary, the object is in fact being avoided because the introverted thinker is building up a world of ideas. And because introverted thinking is fairly liberated for them, they are tolerating thinking thoughts that might prove to be dangerous or subversive or wounding to the other person's feelings that it's a fairly individuated function, so it'll go anywhere and everywhere in their mind, coloring the tone of the interactions. And the person on the other side of that can feel this movement of dark and light that the introverted thinking type is mulling over as they're reacting or, or in interacting with other people. Yeah, it can feel a bit like being objectified of uh, being regarded as an object and a step back and a sort of unrelated quality. Yeah, that, that uh, makes me think of an insight I once heard that feels very, very relevant is um, if you're an extroverted feeling type, it really matters to you uh, what the relational context is of the conversation. Mm-hmm. So that you have a conversation with someone and they do what you just did, Deb, which is you nod your head and say, uh-huh. And it's these little kind of unconscious communications about, I hear you, you're okay, we're connected, maybe there's a smile. But if you uh, walk into a room and you sit down and talk to someone who doesn't do that, mm -hmm. doesn't nod, doesn't uh, use body language or facial expressions that encourages you to continue talking doesn't smile. If you are an extroverted feeling type, that makes you feel like you just fell into the void. It's high, It's highly anxiety provoking and you may not even be aware of why you're feeling so anxious. But there hasn't been a relational container established. If you're primarily an introverted thinking type, you're not so concerned with establishing that relational container. You're in your own head, you're having your thoughts, and you don't need to get that relational connection first before you can proceed. Mm -hmm. And for the introverted thinking type, their thoughts are delicious. <laughs> like it's incredibly <laughs> gratifying, incredibly interesting, and following these kind of bee trails through the internal air of their thinking is infinitely compelling. 
So they're very involved <laughs> with, <laughs> with their thoughts. And again, for extroverted mm-hmm. feeling types, it's, it's just, we're not sure what's going on in the room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of this really helps to put in perspective uh, our differences uh, rather than uh, the meaning that we can make of it of, oh, this other person doesn't care uh, versus no, just a whole different process. And, And because, you know, here we are, you know, in this country with a cultural kind of typology, as it were. Uh, we tend to think we're much more the same than we really are. Well, it's funny. You were saying that, but then internally I was thinking, well, really, I feel like we're a different species. <laughs> like <laughs> when I'm talking to an introverted thinking type, I'm like, like, are you from another planet? You know, yeah. like I'm like, we're visiting aliens, alien beings uh, <laughs> have come forward. And interestingly enough, often when aliens are, um, uh, depicted mm-hmm. in literature and movies, mm-hmm. they they often have very little emotion, which I find really yeah. strange. Yeah, so it's like uh, like um, uh, Spock on the original Star Trek would be a great image of sort of introverted thinking. I'm wondering how uh, our mythological wellsprings f- and fairy tales and all of that uh, depict introversion. Uh, because it is embedded in human nature. So we've talked so much about myth and fairy tale in other contexts. I'm wondering how it relates to this context. Well, one um, possibility could be the myth of Persephone, and that Persephone has these two sides to her personality that her mother Demeter seems like a tremendous extrovert. She's focusing on the world and making things a bloom and she's tending to the children of the earth and the fertility of these things. And Persephone follows behind kind of dancing alongside her mother and picking flowers and being in this kind of warm world. But she is quite explicitly the child when she's finally pulled into the underworld, which we might say is the inner life is where she discovers her power that she's a queen, that she can easily relate to these underworld spirits and images and archetypes that are not visible in the external world. And and one might even say that it was when she discovered her introversion that she really claimed her true adult potency. That's that's lovely, Joseph. I think that's a a, a great way to think about it. You know, she was drawn down into this world of darkness and mystery. And that is where she discovered her tremendous authority. And this is often true that for introverts, or let's say introverted women, particularly relative to the myth, that an introverted woman who's been forced to be extroverted, maybe because of family dynamics or the school system, can often feel alienated and awkward and perhaps even functioning externally in a younger way, because functioning outside of our typology is always awkward. And then finally getting to a place where she can claim and defend the integrity of her introversion. It's like, it's, it's like you've taken off a horrible scratchy coat and you finally are living in your own skin. What about the sea hair? Well, I think the seer could be an example of how powerfully some introverts will defend against having their internal experiences Mm -hmm. interfered with by outer people or outer circumstances, and they can be perceived as rejecting or, or in more intense cases, even hostile towards being interfered with. So in the tale of the sea hare, if I'm remembering it correctly, The king has a daughter who's very, very beautiful, brilliant, and the king has been unsuccessful in convincing her to marry. And then through a certain amount of finagling, he's able to compel her 
to accept or receive a, a, a group of suitors, and she has the right to task them uh, to prove their worth to her. And if they fail the task, then they're executed. Well, that seems fair. Hmm. Yeah. Sounds like an introvert. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, so she has this enormous tower in the kingdom, and at the top of the tower is a glass room. And from that vantage, she can see all across the world, and she can see everything and anything within this internal, somewhat isolated tower. Mm -hmm. And so one by one, the various princes try to disguise themselves or hide and she can easily discern them from this internal place. And in seeing them, she finds them unworthy and has them executed. So, I mean, this is a very dramatic kind of outpicturing, but it speaks to the feeling that sometimes that introverts have that they, they do not want their internal world intruded upon. Mm -hmm. That even the image of the of the lover, of the animus, the internal image, the archetypal image of the animus is so gratifying and so real, legitimately real for her, that she doesn't want some disappointing outer person to be mucking around and interfering with her inner life. Finally, one of the princes somehow discovers a, a magical capacity and he turns himself into a sea hare, which is a, some kind of an aquatic worm. And he's able to slowly work his way up into the tower and actually be right near her. And because he's so close to her, she cannot find him as she peruses the outer world. And at the end of the day, he transforms back into the prince and tries to claim the princess as his bride and the difficulty I think in the fairy tale she has with accepting that a real person is requiring a real relationship. And that can be a struggle for introverts sometimes. So let's talk a little bit about introverted intuition. So introverted intuition, whether it's your primary function or a secondary function, is concerned with the background processes of consciousness. And a person using this function in a differentiated way, or a way that's very powerful for them, that the unconscious images acquire the dignity of things. That's a quote from Jung. But that's a profound statement. I'll read that again. With introverted intuition, Unconscious images acquire the dignity of things. So my, my auxiliary function is introverted intuition. And when I am inside of myself, looking at the internal images, they do feel as real as outer objects. You and I share the same typology, Joseph. And I would say uh, that really rings uh, true. And the difficulty for me sometimes is being able quickly to convert that uh, through my inferior thinking function into words. Whereas if I can sit with something for a while and write, that's a good channel for me, a very good channel for me. I think it's difficult to convert intuition into consciousness and language uh, on the spot, uh, at least for me. A and yet I, I definitely attune to the reality of, of those internal images. And with introverted intuition, it really is a magical capacity. Introverted intuitives are able to quite literally, according to Jung, see the archetypal imagery that rises up out of these um, invisible archetypal fields, and they see them in a visual internal way. And so Jung felt that this was the function that was responsible for mystical visionary experiences. 
So anytime that we're exploring that, or if we have a predisposition to it, as I think many artists do, by the way, that the psyche becomes generative as it is in dialogue with these deep, deep underpinnings of things. And whether this is your primary function or second, third, or fourth function, anything that rises up out of the unconscious has a feeling of certainty around it because it's mm -hmm. clothed in kind of glory when it arrives. <laughs> so I experience that in my own typology that as I'm listening, 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 and then I have an image and then I have this like, oh, yes, <laughs> yes, now I grasp it. I remember being in training with you a couple times and um, that quality of yours really kind of constellating some members of the group. I don't remember <gasps> the details now, but you would you would sit and you would listen and then you would just kind of land this very completed picture of what was going on into the room and it kind of raised someone's hackles someday. And, you know, because it's so startling, you know, your intuition will just generate this very detailed, comprehensive image of what's going on in a clinical situation, for example, and then it will just, bam, be there in the room. And it's like magic. It's like, there's no process about it. You didn't fumble. It's just there. And, and it carries a lot of authority and certainty. It's something that's, that can be challenging for me as well. When we're here talking about dream interpretation, I'll often go to my introverted intuition. Mm -hmm. Yes, And I may do that with clients. So I'll ask and ask and ask. And then on that intuitive level, I'll feel at least that I have uh, an internal certainty about the entire arc of the dream. And then I'll want to deliver that in the room. And it can be too much. It's either overpotent or that it's just too detailed. But how to make that um, palatable is a whole other kind of uh, skill, which often I'm lacking, but it is gratifying to bring it forward. And I think also intuitives struggle with a false sense of certainty sometimes mm -hmm. that we often do have to kind of check it out. Yeah. In a certain sense, I'm imagining that the ease with which people enter into active imagination may be related to their access to introverted intuition, given that Jung's feeling that this is part of a mystical visionary capacity. So when I think about the black books and, and the red book, that Jung really discovered, um, perhaps even had this since childhood, that he could drop down into this strata of himself, and it came forward in very visible you know, saturated imagery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus maybe abstract thinking that, uh, you know, Pauly seemed to have this introverted thinking function where he could imagine these extraordinary quantum physics um, ideas, which he would try to communicate to Jung. And Jung would wrap them often in introverted intuition and then try to apply them in this kind of psychological sphere. The final thing I'll toss out is introverted feeling. And how Jung might describe that is that an introverted feeling type, when that's dominant, can only feel the archetypal image of a situation, but they cannot see it. So it comes in through another sensibility. I say more about that. I'll quote um, from Jung again. The depth of this feeling can only be guessed. It can never be clearly grasped. It makes people silent and sometimes difficult to access. Mm. It shrinks back like a violet from the brute nature of the object in order to fill the depths of the subject. It can sometimes come out with negative judgments or assumes an air of profound indifference as a mean of means of defense. So I think it's difficult sometimes for us to really understand the profundity of introverted feeling. Mm -hmm. For instance, when 
somebody with introverted feeling is capturing something and they feel badly towards a person or a situation that they will often feel the entire archetypal category of badness, Mm -hmm. which I think can sometimes show up as a negative inflation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like if something's bad, like the entire world internal war becomes encased in kind of Sauron like darkness. Mm. And often it won't lift until the archetypal badness, for instance, is felt through that it has to be somehow metabolized by the individual. Conversely, when introverted feeling types have a positive response to a person, that the entire archetype of goodness can be um, invoked. And again, that can make it difficult to relate to the nuances and failings of the person in front of them, because that field of feeling is so profound. Again, I've seen this happen with my introverted clients, that they'll talk about a situation that's troubling them, and then as they unpack it, often their thinking about the situation is fairly balanced, and I can think, well, you know, this it's actually, I mean, that was a bad thing, but there are about Mm -hmm, 80% of other things that are neutral or positive. Mm Mm-hmm. But something about the particular problem has activated the archetype of negativity, whether the person suddenly seems all dangerous or all distasteful. And then once that archetypal negativity is hits the feeling, the introverted feeling, it kind of blights everything about the other person. And because it's archetypal, it can't be thought out that somehow it has to be metabolized in order for that person to come back to a a kind of balanced sensibility. It is possible that whenever we are depressed, regardless of our typology, that we are in introverted feeling. Yeah. Oh, that sounds absolutely right to me. So everybody knows what that's like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're pulled underground. We're pulled internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're like Persephone. Right. And the mood, the archetypal mood of the darkness seems to color everything. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the hallmarks of depression, right? Is that it tricks you into thinking it's always going to be this way and that everything is like this. Depression distorts your thinking. And, and, you know, because of exactly what you're saying, Joseph, it just casts this whole mood. It scoops everything up in its spell. And archetypes can inspire thoughts and sensations and and images but they can also inspire feeling states and introverted intuition uh, introverted feeling rather is very very connected to the feeling of the various archetypes so an analyst who leads with introverted feeling and they're doing their archetypal work for them they can categorize the way the archetypes emanate feeling tones almost like a musical scale which is often very important in terms of differentiating the various pieces of it and i'll just toss out one more jungian quote the primordial images are of course just as much ideas as feeling Fundamental ideas, ideas like God, freedom, and immortality, are just as much feeling values as they are significant ideas. And those of us that don't have easy access to introverted feeling, that can seem very abstract. But to introverted feeling types, they totally live in that world. Mm -hmm. They absolutely Mm -hmm. know what that means. Hi, this is Joseph from This Jungian Life Podcast. Lisa, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. 
Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us with as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Okay, today's dream comes from a woman who is 37 years old, and she works as an audiovisual translator. Here's the dream. I'm in the central square of my native city with my grandmother and my cousin. He and I are in our teenage years. We hear a deep rumbling as though a huge mass of water is approaching. We look around trying to figure out which way it is coming from. I see a gigantic wave crashing over the clock tower, which looks more ancient than the one in my real city. The three of us stand facing the wave. My grandmother grabs both of our hands and says, we hardly have a chance. I think that it might be the end, but still hope to survive. The wave hits us. I often dream of huge waves, but I've never been hit by one before. I'm holding my breath underwater. It is dark. Then the water subsides. Now it's completely gone. People walk around as though nothing much happened. I meet a couple of my classmates who are not at all surprised that they survived. And here's some context. She says, I'm single, no kids. The corona crisis forced me to move back in with my mother, whom I love dearly, and from whom I can't seem to separate. I never knew my father. Also, I just had a minor surgery, and I'm taking care of my mother because she broke her arm during my hospitalization. The main feelings in the dream were fear, hope, and amazement at the end. And finally, some additional details. She says, my grandma passed away three years ago at the age of 95. Her passing initiated an existential crisis in me and eventually led me into therapy. As a kid, I spent all my summers at my grandma's. The male cousin in the dream is the one I used to play with during those summers. We used to be great friends, and now we just call each other twice a year. Well, uh, as is my predilection, which I think a lot of listeners already are quite familiar with, the initial situation, the psychic situation as it is, is she is in the central square of her native city with the grandmother and a cousin. Somewhere psychically, uh, she is in her teenage years. So uh, there's a lot right here in that first sentence of the initial situation of the central square Mm -hmm. of, you know, a psychic space of her native city, her origins, with the archetypal mother. Well, and the central square, you know, a, an image of, of this, of a, of a square in the center, mm-hmm. calls to mind the image of a mandala. Yes. And can be possibly an image of the self. And I'm remembering Jung's famous uh, dream that everyone refers to as his Liverpool dream where uh, he dreamt that he was in Liverpool in the central square of the city, uh, and in the middle was this magnificent magnolia tree uh, blooming despite uh, fog and and rain and uh, kind of darkness. So, um, of course, just the setting itself calls up a lot of psychic imagery that is important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so something kind of central is going on here. Mm-hmm. And then we have, oh, the clock tower. Well, I think uh, for me, I'm still sitting in the context that you guys have unpacked really well. To be in the central square, of course, does evoke the self. And it lets us know that whatever is happening in that platform is deep, it's archetypal, it's profound. And so the intensity of the dream and the intensity of the wave makes sense to me. 
that it would be so tremendous. And people often feel very ambivalent about images of, of the self. People dream of tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes. In one sense, we can all be optimistic and say, oh, you know, it's these acts of the self, acts of God. But the images really show the bivalence of the action of the self that, mm -hmm. yes, it holds all of this promise for a reorganization on a higher arc. And that can be deeply frightening and incredibly stressful. So I'm, I'm just holding the intensity of that. Also thinking about the grandmother and the cousin and them particularly being in the teenage years. Mm -hmm. When I think about my own life as a teenager, uh, certainly gigantic waves crashing through my psyche, through my body, through my understanding of the world. And so it feels like it's a return to a kind of tumult that she may have experienced as a teenager that is still struggling to come to a conclusion of some kind, to create a solid platform from which she might take another step. So Deb, you were talking about the grandmother, the archetypal mother complex, being part of the energy there. We were talking about the clock tower also, and although it's an inorganic image, we might stretch a little bit and think that that's the presence of some kind of a father principle, a kind of phallic tower, and Kronos, the god of time, mm -hmm. being associated with the kind of linearity mm -hmm. of consciousness, of ego consciousness. I wish I could call up more about this, but the, the image of a clock tower, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of picturing a maybe a central European city for some reason, and in older European cities, you know, clocks were put up on the central tower because that would have been the way that most people could have access to it. You know, there weren't clocks everywhere. The clock itself was a relatively uh, late invention. You know, I, I, I wish I could place it in time exactly. Medieval cities, of course, there would have been the church spire but also in the begin in the renaissance in renaissance italian cities anyway the central square would have been the the place where the government buildings were and there would have been a tower that sort of symbolized kind of secular authority and i don't know when kind of clocks come in there but joseph i'm just building on this idea of what the clock tower might hold this this sense of mm -hmm. kind of a masculine principle Yes, and since she never knew her biological father, it would make sense that the father principle would show up in a in a what we would call an unmediated form, in a highly abstracted form. And I'm also thinking of uh, what you said, Lisa. It's uh, the secular uh, symbol uh, and the the principle by which people in a town, if we literalize this, orient. Mm -hmm, uh, exactly. We all know where yeah. the clock tower is. We all know that when we say we're going to meet there at a specific time, we can all see that time. That is the central orienting principle of daily life, chronos, uh, and, and the business, mm -hmm. uh, just like the business of, of government. It's sort of like ego consciousness again, as Joseph mm -hmm. said a minute ago, right? So, so somehow this wave a formless, you know, water crashes over this. You know, we might wonder if the water is associated with the feminine principle, with emotion. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something profoundly archetypal, something that feels like it's going to overturn everything. And the archetypal mother has this declaration that we hardly have a chance, mm -hmm. a chance to survive, it's implied. And I'm really captured by the fact that the dreamer and her animus, which was mm -hmm. a teenage cousin, are both so young. Yeah. And they're there with the great mother, you know, the ancient, the arcane mother. And she says that she's single. She has no kids. She's living back with her mother as she's recovering. Both of them are recovering. So it evokes some kind of challenge to the Puella complex. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think she even puts her finger on it, you know, the need to separate from the mother and to, to live her own life. And that might mean constellating 
a more robust animus energy. You know, I was really struck, and I don't usually do this, but I'm, I'm going to go here by some of the language in the context. She says, I just had minor surgery and I'm taking care of my mother because she broke her arm during my hospitalization. I was so struck by that because to me, even just that sentence and how it's language kind of speaks to a certain amount of enmeshment between the dreamer and her mother potentially. I mean, it's possible I'm reading way too much into this, but I just, she had minor surgery and while she had surgery, her mother got injured. And now the dreamer who, who I would understand to be convalescing herself, I mean, it, it was minor, but, but still she had surgery, is taking care of her mother. So there seems to be this conflation of, you know, whose needs are who are, are belong to whom kind of thing. And, and somehow the dreamer is in a caretaking position, even though perhaps she might be compromised herself. There's such a strong feeling tones and real life tones around the feminine and mothering of the grandmother in in real life who passed away three years ago and uh, initiated an existential crisis in her. The grandmother in the dream is the linking function between her and her cousin. So we have grandmother in the middle holding hands with her and her cousin on on either mm -hmm. side mm -hmm. and the mother and then the image of water which is often a associated with uh, ocean and waves with the unconscious and feeling so there is a huge real life and dream imagery infusion of the feminine and we have it uh, you know the clock tower as an image of a masculine principle but in the streamer's life, it's been a lot of feminine energy. You know, the dream also shows, if if I may, a Nakia, a, a night sea journey, mm -hmm. even if briefly, because she's under the water and it's dark and she doesn't know what's going to happen. She's holding her breath. And so there, there is this descent. Now it's, it's quick, but there is this sort of Jonah in the belly of the whale moment in this dream. And so I wonder if that also says something about her current psychic situation or perhaps something that might be awaiting her just around the corner is, is a kind of frightening descent. Or, or perhaps it references the existential crisis she has already been through. I've been thinking about something that she's been fearful of, which seems monumental, like this giant wave, that in fact is not so awful after all. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that, oh my gosh, here comes this horrible wave. Ah. And the grandmother is very fearful. We hardly have a chance. But in fact, it's not that big a deal. And the classmates are not at all surprised that they survived. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. I was thinking that as well. Again, it makes me want to circle back to some kind of developmental process as a teenager, a transition into adulthood, that whatever the wave represents, which might be autonomy, it might be some kind of intense activation, as you said, of animus independence, that as she compares her own experience to her friends, they've navigated really easily and successfully. And it gives us a sense, as you were saying, Dev, of perhaps a histrionic thread in this relationship, maybe even a, a penchant to exaggerate, a penchant to make things larger in general mm -hmm. than they might need to be. And when we think about histrionic character style, it is often a defense against a much deeper, more soulful experience and can be a defense against relatedness, deep and connected relatedness. So again, not knowing the stream personally, but again, the idea of her being single without children, it is very possible that the exaggeration of danger prevents her from tolerating the kind mm -hmm. of deep connection which she is probably craving on some 
primal level. Yeah. I'm also imagining that somewhere, not immediately in the dream, we we have the archetypal masculine figure of Poseidon, because it's Poseidon that causes these sort of tsunamis. Hmm. Uh, first, there has to be an earthquake somewhere where the tectonic plates shift, and then these monumental waves are are generated. Of, so I wonder if there is um, also a defense or a fear of the masculine principle that's represented in one aspect as the clock tower, but uh, somewhere else far away, uh, there's a fearfulness of this angry, powerful, Poseidon-like yeah, energy. Yeah, that's really interesting. Deb, that's really interesting. And and that that masculine principle that can make the earth move under mm-hmm. your feet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm certain. Now you've put me in, in the mind of Neumann <laughs> and, uh, and his work on the great mother and, and the way that the great mother can um, operate in the psyche in favor of sort of stasis. There can be a suffocating quality to the mother principle. Don't go too far. Mm-hmm. Don't don't stray. Mm-hmm. Let me keep my arms around you. It's a dangerous world out there. Mm, yeah, there you go. So when we tie all that together, it feels like this is a threshold dream, perhaps. Mm-hmm. I really like what you just said, Joseph, and um, it inspires me to reach out to the dreamer and say, can you use this as a threshold dream? (laughs) That's great. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.